I get, I'm real quiet, I blend in, yeah. So uh, this is a waffle bot, and uh, it's kind of a lot to carry around the country, actually the globe. Uh, so I, I came up with this project about a year ago, I'll get into that. Uh, first, I'm, I'm sorry, many of you don't know me. Um, my name is Jonan, I'm from Portland, Oregon, and uh, I go by The Jonan Show on the internet. So you can find me on Twitter and GitHub, uh, probably not worth your time in either case. Uh, I don't tweet very often and the code is, my first Rails app is up there, you can find it. I deployed it to Heroku back in uh, 2011 maybe, 2012, um, and it was called Warm Warrior, which was kind of a creepy, you know how it like randomly assigns names? I really didn't like that one. People would get like Meadow Ninja and stuff and I got Warm Warrior. Uh, so I work at that company now. And I work there because I love their product and I always have. Uh, I came through a, a boot camp when I was, um, back then in like 2011, I was working for a small company in Bend, Oregon, and I uh, was doing like PSD chopping when we would make IE6 compatible CSS uh, so that we could put the, the images pixel perfect. We would overlay a JPEG on top of the web page and then line up our little divs, nudging them a pixel at a time. The web is a much better place now. <laughs> And we had the biggest party when we sunset IE6 support at that company. Um, so I've always wanted to work at Heroku, and now I do, and I'm a developer advocate. And uh, that's, like if you are a, an engineer now, or a developer now, and you sometimes think like, I wish I had more meetings and more marketing buzzwords in my life, uh, then you should probably become a developer advocate. It's a really good time. Uh, that being said, this was mostly financed by Heroku, so that's a pretty good deal that I built a waffle-making robot, uh, or not waffle-making, it remains to be seen. So, uh, this is the waffle maker that I used. It's made by Cuisinart. It has a Christmas tree because I got it for Christmas last year from my children. And the day after Christmas, I was standing there in the kitchen. Uh, I mean, like, waffles take kind of a long time, like seven or eight minutes a piece. And you get one out and then it's immediately gone because the kids are just like round robin, you know, coming back from, you're like 15 waffles deep and you're like, I am a robot. <laughs> oh wait, I have an idea. Because I was holding this little handle on the end and I thought, well this is a pretty simple motion, right? So this you just flip over. It's one of those waffle makers, you, you lift the lid up, you close it and you flip it over, right? It's like, well those are things pretty easily replicated by motors, uh, I could probably take this project out in a cool month. Ha 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 is right. So this is when I started. Uh, February 3rd, I put a date on this slide only. Uh, this is basically just like a photo tour of my life with Wafflebot. Um, you're not gonna see very much code, if any, except when I actually like get into the console and try and make it, make a waffle for you. Um, but I started out with this Raspberry Pi here this is a, a touch um, display with a Raspberry Pi in the back of it. And then underneath it, I have a whole uh, box full of electronics with some circuits that I, I wired up. Also, I don't know very much about electronics. This was a huge learning experience for me uh, and a real painful one. On the left side, you can see these servos here. Those servos, this is like death row of servos right here. They didn't know it at the time, but they were doomed. All of the servos. I killed a lot of servos. This is where I got a lot of my supplies. It's around the corner from me and I just wanted to show you what this place looks like because it's so cool. This is a place called Surplus Gizmos in Beaverton, Oregon and they have a Burger King sign up in the back. They basically go and like desolder components off of boards. They buy like bulk uh, industrial equipment, huge like uh, manufacturing conveyors and things and they have them all disassembled in this place. Like you can get a, a stepper motor that could flip over a car in this place. It's incredible. Uh, unfortunately, they know it and they're a little bit spendy sometimes. I mean like there's a circuit board for a dollar. I feel like you can buy 20 of those for a dollar. In any case, it's worth it when you uh, don't even have time for Amazon shipping because you are repeatedly flying around the country trying to give this talk uh, and every single time, three out of four times so far, the waffle bot has been destroyed in transit. Uh, to a point that I could not save the day. Uh, yesterday, Wafflebot was also destroyed in transit. Shocking, but true. Um, I have a good trick for that, by the way. So I carry this in two different Pelican cases, 
And you can put locks on the Pelican cases, but they've got to be TSA safe locks. Except in the United States, there is a firearm law. If you carry a firearm on an airplane, including a flare gun that is unloaded, then you can have it inspected when you check your baggage and lock it with real locks and they're not allowed to open it and rearrange all of your waffle butt packing with your carefully arranged foam and, and then just pile it back in. I've got some pictures of that too. <laughs> so this is my waffle maker from underneath. This is uh, when I first started getting into like the wiring of the thing. So my theory was I want to twist this thing, right? But I also need to be able to lift it. So I couldn't very well attach an axle to the front of this thing, right? Because then I'm going to have to make that this, if I have a motor on the front of it and it's twisting like this, that whole assembly is going to have to go up with the waffle maker at some point, right? Um, and so I thought, well, I'll just come in through the back here and I'll put it through. There's like a little axle on the back, right? And you can come and check it out afterwards. But it's like a little plastic piece that looks kind of like this, right? And I thought I would just run a metal axle through here and kind of melt it in place and I'd be able to twist the whole thing, right? Uh, but this is when I opened it up and I discovered that that wiring harness there, that on the back, that's all of the control uh, and, and heating wiring going into the waffle maker through the narrow hole that I intended to drill straight out. Uh, so that plan didn't work out. So I came up with some other plans. Um, this is the first iteration of Wafflebot. It was much taller. In fact, exactly half an inch too big for a Pelican case. <laughs> that was poor planning on my part. Uh, I have this aluminum frame here because my theory was if I can't move the whole mechanism up, I can set the lid on the, the twisty bit, right? So I have a little metal hook on the bottom like this, and it's quite wide. It fits, it has to fit very tightly in the handle. So when the handle comes down, I can then twist that, right? And the handle will come with me. Um, if you look real closely, I wish I had a better picture for you, but on the tip of the motor there, there's like some rivets going on and a set screw and maybe a chunk of wood. Yeah, that's like me coupling an axle. This is apparently an impossible task. They make couplers for 10 millimeter shafts to 12 millimeter shafts or 14 millimeter shafts, uh, but not for this kind of thing. Like couplers are pretty inflexible. If you are a coupler manufacturer, I would like to have some words with you afterwards. It's very difficult to take two shafts and put them together on center. My solution was to take a piece of wood and drill it straight through and then drill back and widen the hole on the other side so I could attach my bit. Uh, and in the end, it was still off, right? So you have kind of this motion, right? In addition to the fact that this cusp here is such a tight fit, so the lid has to land perfectly on it. And then it kind of twists at a wonky angle and kicks itself off or pins itself uh, and tries to snap the arm off of the waffle maker. On the right, I just wanted to uh, like have a, a moment of silence for my Happy Hacker keyboard, which only functioned because I had these, this little adapter here. Uh, it was like an old, old one, right? What is, what is that interface called? PS2 interface? It was a PS2 adapter so I could use it over USB. And it died that day with all of my dreams. <laughs> so this is another close up there. You can also see that I've got this, um, because the angle of this hook was so important, I had to line the shaft up exactly with the waffle maker. This is a very flexible piece here, right? It kind of bends around and snakes and I can lift it up. I can slide the motor mount back and forth across that. If you're trying to build things that require a large amount of torque, Try not to make them super flexible. <laughs> that was another poor design choice that I made in this one. And you can see I've got one motor controller hanging off the side to power my one motor, uh, but then I have another one up on the top that uh, you can kind of see in the corner there. And that one is got, it has a, a bit of paracord tied down onto the handle. So the paracord was looped around the front of the handle here and it would pull it up and then that loop would allow the handle to still rotate, right? I thought I was very clever, but I was also super imprecise. And the whole point of using a stepper motor as opposed to a regular motor, a lot of these things that I'm gonna talk about, like I'm gonna explain to you diodes and things. If it's boring to you, I understand if you wanna get up and walk out. Many of you know a lot about electronics, but some people don't know uh, like what an NPN transistor actually does or how to use it. Uh, like me six months ago, for example. 
So uh, this is the, the shaft assembly that I had going for me that never really worked properly. I, I got maybe one out of 10 turns, I could flip the thing over. Um, and so I, I was like, well, you know what I could do? I just take some of these servos here, I'll put a servo right on the front of that, and then I can just like strap it to the sides with aluminum. Um, and you know, servos, they, my impression of like the purpose of a servo was that it would just not do a full rotation, right? It was, it was handy because you could go this way and you could have like very precise control over them, much like a stepper motor, but you didn't have to keep going around and spinning, right? Um, and so I ordered some expensive high torque servos. Um, a high torque servo is designed to like flap a large model airplane wing <laughs> instead of a small model airplane wing. They are not designed for the kind of torque that I'm generating just in twisting this handle. And it's amazing to me that I was standing there the day after Christmas thinking how very simple this problem is. I think that this is a common thing among developers. <laughs> when we look at a thing and you're like, I could probably do that, I think I can do it. And then you get excited and you're like, this is gonna be easy. And then a year later you have a broken waffle maker <laughs> on stage in front of all of these people you admire. So this is uh, similar to one of the five servos that were about 40 bucks a piece that I murdered in the process of learning what torque was. Um, I was trying to show you something specific here that I don't recall, so I'm not going to. Uh, oh yes, uh, so in the background there, behind the screen, that big white thing, that's a Costco milk jug, those square ones. It was perfect because it fit directly between those aluminum rails that I have the, the brass bits on. This frame, by the way, that alone probably took me like 20, 25 hours to fashion this whole thing with the rivets. I forget sometimes how lucky we are to work in software and just have that like control Z thing. Because when you rivet a piece of aluminum, like that one's just ruined. And now you've got to cut another piece exactly like to the millimeter and shave it down. And don't get a half inch too big or it won't fit in your Pelican case. So um, that milk jug in the back was going to be a gravity feed. You can see hanging down in the middle a little brass part. That's this. So this bit right here is a solenoid valve. It's a valve that opens when powered um, and locks when it's unpowered, right? So if you want to get the solenoid on the side of this deal to uh, open up, like um, if I, I, I have to put the power in there to do it, but I'll show you in a little bit maybe um, that this will, will work. Uh, so the solenoid valve is in line with the pump here. And then on the bottom of the milk jug, I have a silicone, a flow meter, uh, underneath it. So my theory was that I would have these three brass pieces screwed together and I would put the batter in the milk jug and maybe I have to fill it all the way to the top but I get a lot of gravity going for me and no it does not push waffle batter through a hole that big. I think it was like a half inch diameter on these pipes and when it's going through a solenoid valve and then through a fan uh, it didn't move at all. Like I, I had this frame that I spent 30 hours building and I've got another 100 hours into the robot already and I go to do the whole thing and the part that I was least worried about screwed me over. And I feel like there's another analogy to software there <laughs> because that's pretty much every project actually I've ever been on. Like the part that we assumed was known was the longest and most difficult. So this took me some more time to do. Um, this is a new version. This is like the new frame as I was like taking over the kitchen I have another shot later of more taking over of the house. I actually have my own office with like a wraparound desk around the walls, but that was already full. <laughs> so I took over the countertop here uh, because usually it was a situation where like, I, I started this project as a hack day project at Heroku. And uh, we have a hack day once a year where you, you just kind of go and do what you want to do, right? And I was like, I'm going to build a, a, a waffle making robot People were like, I'm gonna see if I can improve our Kafka efficiency. I'm gonna work on the, <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna make a waffle, probably. <laughs> so I spent that eight hours on it and I legitimately believed I had a shot of like finishing this in that day's work. Not even close. I mean, I've probably over the past year pulled 10 all-nighters or close to on this one. Because every single time I was under a deadline, I was flying down to San Francisco and this kind of thing to work on requires a huge amount of equipment, right? If I pull one of these wires too hard, 
and I desolder it for some little board, where am I gonna get a soldering iron in downtown LA with like 30 minutes notice, you know? Oh, I brought my soldering iron with me. I brought everything with me. I brought 200 pounds of luggage in two Pelican cases. Um, and I also fit some clothes in there. Uh, my wife is very pleased to hear that. She pointed out that uh, naked people have very little or no influence on society. <laughs> so this is the back of this board here. This um, screen, there are a bunch of GPIO pins on the back of this. Um, gen generic programming input output, is that right? General programming? Um, these pins, there are 40 of these pins on most Raspberry Pis. The original ones had 30 on them. And this is basically how you do everything you're gonna do with a Raspberry Pi. When you're building a robot or a waffle maker or whatever it is you're gonna accomplish, right? Um, I have 18 minutes left and I need to pause because taking it takes about 10 minutes to make a waffle if we're gonna actually make one. Um, but this, the problem that I ran into here was that I needed all of these GPIO pins for all of the various devices, right? Because using these motor drivers that I have here, it allows me not to have to drive the stepper motors off of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, a stepper motor is a, a motor that basically like ticks. You can think of like ticking around a gear, right? I can say go to the right 50 steps and it will come back 50 steps and be in exactly the same nanometer where it was before. And you can cut them down even farther. These steppers can take uh, a stepper motor that has say 200 steps and it can um, do an eighth of a step on each of those steps, right? So um, I can go like 1,600 steps to get a full rotation out of this. And uh, it allows me to be very precise, but it also the primary benefit of using these drivers is that I don't have to take up all of these pins on the board. So this, these pins that I'm using here are for the, the, um, the display, but it turns out if you power the display independently, you don't have to use the SPI interface at all. So I got to bypass that whole problem and I just ran a little ribbon cable through the side. Um, but with the, the motors, a single motor would take up uh, like four slots out of these 40. And it's not like all of the 40 can be used, right? This is what they look like. This is my, my GPIO diagram that I've been dragging around the planet with me. Uh, and I highly recommend if you are working with a Raspberry Pi to just have this by your side and write down what you're plugging in where. Because it's actually pretty easy to fry your components inadvertently. Uh, or to feed 12 volts back into a GPIO pin on your Raspberry Pi, if you're not paying attention. Um, so I have this little diagram here, but you can see the green ones here are the ones that we can use for our GPIO stuff. Uh, the, like the yellow ones up here, those double as, um, as serial uh, transmit and receive ports. So you could plug in like a serial port, like an old serial port into the, um, let's see, it's like the fourth and the fifth one down on the right side, GPIO 14 and 15. And the problem with those ones and some of these other ones with the X's is that the Raspberry Pi, when it boots up, takes some of them high and some of them low. And then it flips them and then it goes back. And you, you're thinking like, okay, but I went to like the very first place I can get access to the boot up process and I turned that pin off, doesn't matter. It's all out of your control. There's nothing you can do in software to stop some of these pins from shooting high when the Raspberry Pi boots, right? This was a very surprising thing to me um, and I'll show you why in a moment. So this is my first iteration of uh, soldering a little circuit board. And you can come admire my soldering work later. It's really not good. Uh, I have soldered things in the past, but also pretty badly. Uh, and I kept getting advice from people that you heat the element, not the iron, right? This is what everyone tells me. It doesn't make any sense to you until you just kind of see it happening, I guess. Uh, but then it took me another two years longer than that. So uh, the idea is that if I have my soldering iron approaching from this side, then I'm holding my solder over here. In order to start my soldering, my solder melting, I'm gonna have to tap the iron a little bit, right? But then once it's melting, I wanna mostly be applying heat to the component that I'm trying to solder in place. Because metals, like when you're welding or soldering, will flow towards the highest heat, right? So if you have a very hot little copper pin here, and a you know, slightly cooler soldering iron, because it's just a little bit farther away, the solder will glom onto the pin and you get these nice, beautiful little solder holes, unlike this nonsense. Please come and admire my tomfoolery later. So this circuit board was the cause of two of my problems, basically. Because these soldering bits on the bottom were weak 
And in many cases, I have soldered jumper wires into the board itself. This is not the way you should build these things, right? Much like software, uh, your components in a system like this should be uh, modular, right? I wanna have reusable pieces all over the place. I want a circuit that does one thing, not everything, right? At the time, I was in San Francisco and I had only brought one circuit board and my only option was to drive down to Silicon Valley and buy more. So I just soldered and soldered and soldered and made this mess. It was real bad. Uh, but you know, you'd lose one connection and that's five hours work when you find it and then you have to plug it back in again. So uh, this is me taking over the living room, the previous mess you saw on the kitchen there. This is the living room. That is a, a Thanksgiving table about this size that takes up a good solid half of the living room. I, di I did that and then I put my waffle bot in my Pelican case and I left. <laughs> and my wife and kids enjoyed that mess. I'm a real bad person, but it's for your entertainment. Uh, this is another nice piece of work that I did. So the, again, the circuit board thing, you're gonna wanna use those. Um, the nice thing about a board like this is it's got these little metal rings around the holes, right? That metal, when it heats up, will also attract the solder and the solder will stick to it. If you were just soldering two pieces of metal together, they are never going to be hot at the same time and you're going to have a blob of solder over here and a blob of solder over here. And even worse, there is a resin core in your solder that will sometimes coat your blob of solder on this side. And so then you put your other blob of solder together and it sticks, you did it, success, but there's a layer of resin in beneath and you don't have conductivity. And if you forget to check all of your connections, which you should absolutely do as you're going along with your multimeter, there are only two things you really need to know with a multimeter, is like uh, continuity testing, be able to push the probe to this wire, touch the probe to this wire, see the electricity go back and forth, and the voltage measurement, right? So this is the control box that you see reworked here. Uh, this is the TSA's handiwork. I was in Chicago, I think, and they had opened my case to inspect it uh, and then couldn't close it again. <laughs> and so they just went with this plan. <laughs> it was pretty good. Also reminds me of software. <laughs> uh, this here is the side of my suitcase that was just under a plane and over conveyor belts and had lots of tiny electronic components in it. And I don't even know what I lost if I lost anything. And then this waffle maker right here on the back got a crack and I was crushed. This was the third breaking of the waffle maker, the third time that this was destroyed. This is the one I got from Christmas for my kids and I wrecked it. The other day I was standing in the kitchen with my waffle bot trying to get it to work. I'll show you the waffle we made in a second and my son goes, remember when we just used to make waffles? <laughs> I'm such a bad father for this. I blame you. Uh, so this is a Geiger counter. I think if you read the abstract, which was all lies, by the way, you heard something about a Geiger counter. The Geiger counter is actually a really cool instrument. Um, you order this kit from Adafruit, I think I got this one from. You can assemble it all yourself. And it's the, in the plastic wrap there is the Geiger tube. They're really, really fragile. If you ever happen to get a Geiger counter, they're kind of fun to play with be very delicate with the tube. That's the most expensive part. It's got a, um, it's a gas filled cylinder with a tungsten um, thread in the middle. And it detects radiation uh, when uh, particles hit and ionize the gas inside. I have a, this here. So you see like uh, a radioactive particle. This one that I use uh, just has beta particles. I think it only detects beta particles, which is conveniently uh, what carbon-14 gives off. So carbon-14 uh, is naturally radioactive. It's a radioactive isotope of carbon, and all carbon uh, exists in a combination of its isotopes, and all food contains carbon. Therefore, you are eating radioactive food every day. And the next time someone wants to talk about uh, Fukushima power plants, you can be like, shut up, dude. You just ate a banana. That's like 10x, right? Uh, which is true, actually. Bananas have a lot of radiation in them, but they're not dangerous for you. You're being irradiated right now, and you look fine to me. So uh, this little particle comes in here, splits the electron from the ion. The electron flees towards the center coil, and along the way builds up more electrons, and they strike it very quickly, but then um, the electricity is released through this anode here, and we're done. So like a Geiger counter makes that little 
That's all the electrons just hitting a little bit. So my Geiger counter uh, had a pretty serious flaw in that the serial port output doesn't work on the one that I bought. They're $100, by the way. There's like one little four pin interface you can use to plug into a thing and actually get data out of it, um, aside from just like the ticks. So the theory was that I was going to measure the radioactivity of the waffles and use it as an additional vector for improving the quality of the waffles over time. <laughs> Artificially intelligent waffle maker. All right. Um, these boards are terrible, don't use them. They don't have little metal rings and they're really hard to solder on. It's bad. I was showing you the diodes here. This is like a little one-way flow thing. Um, given that I have eight minutes left, I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna show you a robot maybe work and then we'll keep talking while the robot maybe cooks. Is this, uh, it's gonna need to warm up too, so. I'm gonna make some waffle mix right now. I wanna find a more interesting slide to show you. Oh, this is my new improved circuitry. Look at me, right? I'm the best. So I took all of that nonsense out and I built these things because it was way better. This is my power thing in the middle. So I've got all of those little rails to put power plugs on and then the four corners that I can plug loose wires into. The one next to it, if you look on the bottom there, it's got three transistors on it. Those are um, TIP 120 NPN transistors. NPN stands for negative, positive, negative. So on the bottom of a transistor, you have three little legs like this the collector, the base, and the emitter. And uh, we are aiming to add electricity to the collector. We have the, um, the plus going into the base, right? And then you, you increase the current on the collector and that opens a connection between the base and the emitter. So in a, uh, what I would do is I would connect the, the negative wire to the emitter and the negative wire to the collector and then a positive in the middle. And when I apply a charge, that will, um, pass on more electricity than I would otherwise want to handle. So I'm using these because I'm using 12 volts on these motor drivers, and the 12 volt motor drivers, um, I don't want that passing through my Pi, right? So I have it going through these transistors, the Pi lifts up the collector to three volts, and that turns on the 12 volts to fly through the other thing. I feel like at this point, I'm just like the most boring part of this presentation, because you guys are about to see it not do its thing. Um, Internally, the code here is uh, unfortunately very simple at this point. So initially there were like three or four distinct Raspberry Pis strapped to this thing. Um, yes. And the, the point was that I wanted to learn about how to use Kafka. Uh, has anyone used Kafka? <laughs> yeah? You kind of have to manufacture use cases to come up with a reason to play with Kafka. Like, Unless you work at Twitter or New Relic, you really don't have a good reason to be like, I'm gonna casually add Kafka to this application. Um, and I made a poor choice, I think. <laughs> I think it's safe to say. I, I don't understand why, uh, but somehow I've backed up a huge number of events in my Kafka topics. And so I, uh, every time I power on the, or I like start the code, it immediately consumes like 50 events. And then one of those actually like causes it to start making a waffle and fortunately blocks. Uh, but I think it's on like an infinite waffle loop. And I can't stop it. So I give up. Um, but I did get it to do something vaguely resembling waffle making the other day with my kids. Uh, oh, wait, no, this was before that happened. Yeah, that's when I sprayed water all over my electronics. I spent hours and hours. Uh, don't do that. Don't do that, that's a bad choice. Just like don't do food. You hear the beeping? It's pretty exciting. I actually have a trigger wired up to that piezo buzzer on the bottom here, so this puts out like six or seven volts um, to my Raspberry Pi that will tell me when um, I need to flip the waffle. But of course I don't care about what the, the button thinks, I care what my artificial intelligence thinks. My TensorFlow thinks about how long I should cook the waffle, right? <laughs> I want TensorFlow to decide the, uh, how to best improve your waffle making experience. So in the end, um, my goal was to have a Wafflebot UI here. You'd walk up and you would click a button and it would say make me a waffle and then it would produce a waffle 10 minutes later and you'd be invited to rate your waffle experience. Um, but that didn't come to fruition. Speaking of, need to detach this real fast so I can oil the waffle iron. 
without burning myself very, very badly. Um, so the, the other Raspberry Pis, what those were doing was they were giving me more GPI, GPIO pins um, so then I can add more sensors because I have a, um, like a nine axis orientation sensor that detects like velocity of the waffle maker as it goes up, which I think we can all agree is the most important part, right? Uh, the orientation of this is actually super valuable to me to know when the lid is all the way up or all the way down because the actuator here is not designed to run on this particular device I'm running it on. So it's a pulse width, pulse width modulation device. The way you get those little gears in a stepper motor to turn is by, um, has anyone ever used PAM before? Here we go. All right, and try not to get any on the electronics. It seems pretty PAMy. Okay. Um, so it, it applies a pulse and then drops it and then applies it and drops it very quickly, right? We're going like five zero, five zero, five zero, five zero, five zero, like a, a thousandth of a second apart, right? You determine based on, and so what um, this actuator wants to do is it wants to just go all the way. Like you give it power and it runs until it can't run anymore and it hits its own shutoff switch. And then you flip the polarity and you run it backwards. And there is a way to assemble a little circuit called an H bridge out of transistors that does that thing automatically for you. Where you can apply a current to one of those transistors and flip the polarity of your circuit one way. But you can imagine that like flipping the polarity in a circuit that you've designed is a pretty dangerous thing if you don't know what you're doing. And I very clearly do not know what I'm doing. Um, so I chose not to go with that and I just hooked it up to this and then kind of like fiddled with the numbers until it worked. But one of the downsides of this is that sometimes the driver says, hey, actuator, you should lift the lid. And the actuator's like, Psh, nah. And then uh, the batter arm comes over and puts the water in the batter on top of the waffle and down over the electronics. And then the lid comes up and breaks off of the arm. Um, it's been a real treat building this. Really enjoyed myself. So uh, let's see if I can actually make it go, shall we? I don't see, I have my little green lights, okay. Um, so basically like my, my goal here was to have this, uh, this web UI and I broke it. But I could start up my little Rails app here and I've got a, oh good. That's not what I wanted I don't think, but it didn't do anything. Ah, you know why it didn't do anything? It didn't do anything because I haven't gone into the actual Pi and started the, the code in there. So I have a problem in that the Ruby script that I'm using needs to have root so it can effectively shut down the Raspberry Pi. You don't want to just unplug power from a Raspberry Pi, it'll corrupt your cards. And if you're traveling around to conferences and planning on having those cards at the ready, that's a real bad plan. So I have this shutdown thing that requires sudo um, and that's not very good for my team. So now if I can SSH into my Wafflebot, because we are hopefully on the same network still, my password is password. <laughs> Verify me. Unable to open display, don't care. And I'm here and I'm in Stroopwaffle. Constantly here Stroopwaffle. And I'm going to herb and require that guy. Uh, Let's see, so this also, um, because all of this code lived on separate pies, it ended up being one pile of code, the strip waffle thing. I think what I'm trying to do is to make a waffle chef, and I think just the act of making it will make it read from Kafka. Oh my God. Okay, wait, I'm just gonna fix the arm. This doesn't count as cheating because I didn't put it right in the first place. Okay, come on, baby. Just one time, make a waffle. Just one waffle is all I want, please. Okay, and now it's got like all these sleeps in there, right? Because I really don't want this arm to swing over and smash anything. This thing is about to pump, oh no. But it's not gonna pump because I didn't prime it. Dang it. I have to prime the pump uh, by sucking on it. 
to get the batter through the pump. That was our dispensing of the waffle. Enjoy. Uh, no one's actually going to get to eat a diseased waffle now. <laughs> See, the actuator kind of hesitates for a second. He's like, I don't know, bro, if I'm going to do it. Okay, I will. But how bad is it then if my other component tries to turn the thing while it's open, right, and hot? It's just broken shards of metal. You really have to come check out this gear on the back. I manufactured a cog to fit around here for this little belt out of PVC pipe that I shaved in like millimeter thickness so that I could attach a belt to turn the thing. Uh, and then I bondoed the inside of that PVC pipe to make it a gear that fit the weird shaped axle thing that's on the back of this that I couldn't otherwise attach to. So now we've got a nice long time sitting there. Um, and I'm out of time, actually. So I'm not gonna talk to you anymore, but I'll whip through my last couple of slides with you. Um, in seven minutes, that's gonna flip back over, and it's gonna have a ghost waffle in it. <laughs> and I'm gonna be real freaking proud of myself because I know that it didn't work because I didn't prime the pump, but that's a human failure, and this is the first time in 200 hours and an entire year of my life that the robot has come even close to making a waffle. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was a waffle that I got that doesn't count because I had to manually run the methods to make it come out. That's what it looked like. My kids ate it. They said it was OK. <laughs> this is me coming down here. This is the inside of my hotel room last night when I realized that my Raspberry Pis uh, were not going to be able to communicate all over the Wi-Fi at the same time. All five or six of them that I had strapped to this thing weren't probably going to be able to talk to each other. So that was pretty bad time. And then it got worse. And then it got worse. And this is, I think, about 3 AM. You can see on the right side where I've hung a bathrobe over the painting so I can project the console from one of my Raspberry Pis onto it. <laughs> because the TV is in hotel mode, which you can't get out of. And it won't let you switch inputs. I actually, I've gotten really good at slipping my hand behind a television and identifying an HDMI port by feel. Uh, so I had my cable in there, but you can't change the input. Here's a picture of my feet to end things out for you nicely. That was 7 a.m. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.